The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Outside the Golden Gate and into the rolling Pacific, amidst howling winds and battering waves, an ominous cluster of granite rocks called the Devil's Teeth emerges from the ghostly fog. These are the Farallon Islands. The Farallons have a varied history. First, they were these islands that were untouched in the middle of the ocean and which people tried to avoid. They also have um, stories of shipwrecks and people who have died in the islands, ghosts that inhabited the shores and howl at night. The Fairlands sit just 28 miles off the coast of San Francisco. On a clear day, they can be seen from the mainland, a jagged outcropping breaking up the line of the horizon. These little islands are actually part of the city of San Francisco. It has, I think, a special meaning to people who live in the San Francisco Bay Area. We see these islands out there. They're islands of mystery. They have been described as the Galapagos of California, isolated and inaccessible. Few know the remarkable abundance of life that emanates from this special place. Today, the rocky islands are federally protected and strictly off limits to all but a handful of scientists who are allowed access to live and work here. Okay, all right, we'll take the line. Russ Bradley manages the Point Reyes Bird Observatory's conservation science program on the islands. All the activities that we do here on the Fairlands, we do in concert and with permission of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And actually, most of the island, most of, of what you can see, is off limits even to us. There are no docks or safe landing areas here. The only way to get on the Fairlands is to transfer into a specially rigged boat and be lifted by a crane onto the rocks. Welcome to the Fairlands. You arrive to a different world. From the moment you step out the door, you are fully immersed in wilderness which does not exist in most of the world where humans live anymore. Here on the Farallon Islands, we're on the largest seabird colony in the contiguous United States. There's over 300,000 breeding seabirds of 13 species. And it's nesting season, it's uh, breeding time, and that's why birds have come to congregate at this place, which is so uniquely located. The island's position within the highly productive California current and eastern Pacific upwelling region makes this place a magnet for marine life and an ideal laboratory to study wide-ranging environmental and oceanic conditions. There are these untouched rocks in the middle of the ocean, so it's a safe haven for animals to rest, to go breed, give birth to their young, right next to this really rich soup out there where they can feed. The dynamic environment is largely a product of the underwater terrain. The Farallons lie just a few miles from the outer continental shelf, where the topography makes a dramatic 6,000-foot drop into the deep abyss. When this unique terrain combines with seasonal shifts in ocean currents, it creates an upwelling of cold, nutrient-rich water that seeds the entire marine ecosystem around the islands. This area, the Gulf of the Farallons, is one of the four upwelling areas in the world. In the summer, the sunshine shines down on the water and it blooms like a field and it blooms with plankton, and the plankton feed the zooplankton, which are like the little insects, which then feed the fish, that feed the whales, and the seabirds, and the sharks, and the seals, and the sea lions. So it's this big, blooming, productive area of the ocean. The loud chorus of seabirds speaks to the resiliency of nature. It was not long ago that these islands were nearly stripped bare of their wild inhabitants, and this walk would have been deathly quiet. 
In the early 1800s, Russian fur traders, attracted by the large population of elephant seals, sea lions, and fur seals, descended on the Farallons. In a short time, the marine mammal population on the islands was completely decimated. Then, in the 1850s, as the population of San Francisco exploded with the gold rush, simple staple items became scarce and valuable. Again, men stormed the islands. There was a shortage of chickens, of all things, in San Francisco. And what the, the locals found is that the common myrrh egg tasted really good. So they brought men out to the Farallon Islands and they had them collect common myrrh eggs. And they would try and collect every last egg. Between 1850 and 1856, one egg company alone took over three million seabird eggs. By the time biologists from the California Academy of Sciences pressured the government to completely end the practice in 1896, the once thriving population of myrrhs on the Farallons was nearly wiped out. Wildlife only began to recover after 1909, when President Theodore Roosevelt declared most of the islands a national wildlife refuge. Today, all 211 acres are protected, and the only humans on the Farallons are those working to better understand and protect this fragile natural ecosystem. The Point Reyes Bird Observatory, or PRBO, has been studying the birds, seals, whales, great white sharks, and other wildlife on and around the islands for the past 40 years. A lot of our research is focusing on trying to basically learn what the animals can tell us about changes that are going on in the local environment, and in, in particular, the local marine environment. In the last few years, the wildlife have had a lot to say. Research is indicating something unusual is happening in the ocean. The long-term data scientists have collected here has given them a good understanding of the natural rhythm of the ocean ecosystem, showing a predictable fluctuation between productive and non-productive years, something they call decadal oscillation. Lately, the natural rhythm seems to be off. The ocean is a very complicated interwoven collection of different processes. And for it to be productive and successful, all those have to fit in together. So if you, if you pull out one of those pieces, it can have major ramifications for certain parts of the food web, which can lead to changes in population and affect the system going forward. More recently, we've seen some different things, some alarming things that have been new in, in our 40 years of studying. We've seen some species like this year, Brant's cormorants, who have been doing very successfully, really not even attempt to breed at all. Climbing up Tower Hill, the highest point on the islands, gives researchers a prime view of all the bird colonies. This gives you evidence of the changes this year. If you look down, you'll see just a few large black birds, Brant's cormorants on nests, and normally this entire area would be filled with hundreds of cormorant nests. They aren't breeding at all this year, which is a very interesting observation and something that we really haven't seen to this magnitude before and it really appears to be linked to their food. That species of forage fish that they've been relying on in the past few years, large northern anchovy, are not present in the system. The fish aren't there and the birds haven't bred. Other species appear to be faring better. Scientists on the islands are actively studying nesting auklets. These little birds are a particularly good indicator of the big picture of the ocean. After several recent years in which they failed to produce chicks, they seem to be rebounding. Eleanor is going to be checking a, a Cassin's auklet nesting box here. We are looking at the timing of their breeding, whether their eggs hatch. By weighing them every five days, we can look at their growth as an indicator of the changes that are going on in the ocean. And right now, we're actually seeing a very productive ocean for Cassin's auklets. These birds feed on krill, and krill right now in the Gulf of the Farallons is very abundant. Krill are at the base of the food chain, so the success of the auklets is good news for many fish, birds, whales, and other animals that live around the islands. 
The ongoing research by PRBO and the other scientists working at the Farallons is providing invaluable insight into the ocean world. And in turn, we're gaining a better understanding of how to protect these islands so vital to the marine ecosystem. We've seen a lot of great recoveries. We've seen a lot of recent events which have caused us concern. And we need to continue to try to do the best we can to study and steward the islands going forward so that the Farallons can continue to return to their original state of, of real, uh, real wildness. Over the past couple of years, we've learned so much about the ocean and both good and bad. We've gone from an era where we polluted the ocean, we dumped our waste in it, we indiscriminately took animals. And we've moved into an era of understanding and appreciating the ocean. And by protecting these special places, it allows us to have this now and hopefully for our kids in the future.